thanks. I've been to Harvard, and I've been to hell. And I think that both experiences train you to make a difference. In the words of the late, great John Lennon, we all want to change the world. Now, I went to Beirut in 1983 with Curtis Wilkie after the U.S. Marines barrack was blown up and 243 Marines died. When you check into the infamous Commodore Hotel, they ask you a question. Do you want to be on the car bombing side or the rocket fire side? <laughs> and there was a parrot in the lobby, when, and he did a spot-on inc incoming Katusha rocket fire impression. It was <laughs> What side do you think I picked on? I took the rocket fire side. The first time I heard it, I hit the deck. And I thought I'd only be gone for a couple days, so I, I told my mom a little white lie. I told her I was going to Lebanon, New Hampshire. <laughs> You know, that's right on the way. But the fighting intensified in the Civil War, and I couldn't leave. And I, I, couldn't also, I couldn't also call home, because in those ancient times, you could tell right away that it was a satellite call. So my mom would call the Boston Globe Photo Department and ask why her son didn't call her back. And they would lie and say, uh, oh, he's uh, heading to the Canadian border. Then one day I was covering fighting in a little village that PLO leader Yasser Arafat was held up in, and there was still, there was shelling going on. Now, I have flat feet, and I run like a duck. A very scared duck. Now, my sister was watching TV in New York and the news, and she saw just my feet running down the street, and she knew it was me. So she dashed out to the out-of-town newsstand in Times Square and bought a copy of the Globe, and I got a message, you know, call home, the jig is up. <laughs> God, I, I hate war. More children are killed in wars than soldiers. It's amazing. Many others are left orphaned or maimed. I don't care what her religion is, no child deserves to be treated like this. Now, in between the thumps and whistles of Katusha rocket fire slamming into Tripoli, Lebanon, a group of Palestinians spotted me. And speaking rapidly in Arabic, they hustled me to a door. And it was like a castle door with a wooden bolt across it. And I could smell death. They flung open the doors, and I saw dozens of bodies piled on the ice in the morgue. And for a moment, a paranoid moment, I thought that they were going to keep me there as a prisoner. But instead, they wanted me to photograph the innocent victims of war. And to do so, I had to climb over the bodies of the victims in the foreground to show the, the villagers in the background and the stench. And amid the bodies was this girl there in the foreground, a beautiful little girl. She, was, she had a pink dress on, and I just knew that it was like a birthday dress, and this was her birthday, and, and she's gone. And for me, that's, that's something that's forever sealed in my memory. Now, there are more than 60 different militias in Lebanon, and I didn't want to be thought of being in any of them. So to, do, to separate myself, I wore a Red Sox hat. And well, that means there is but one God or something like that. And the Red Sox hat helped me because a 300 millimeter lens looks a lot like a, a rocket propelled grenade launcher. The bizarre thing about war is they don't fight in the rain. So you get rain delays, just like in baseball. <laughs> and during one of them, I was photographing kids armed with rifles. 
but I was worried that the skies would clear and the fighting would, res would resume. And I was with another photographer. I know. I, I was with another photographer who wanted to stay, and you can't leave a colleague behind. So, of course, it stops raining, and the shooting resumes. Now, I'm scared, and I'm pinned down behind a car, and I notice this fighter, he's got, he's made eye contact to me, and he's locked onto me. He is looking at me, and he's got this Kalishnikov rifle slung around his neck, and he's got this big, thick mustache, and he's glaring right at me, and I'm sure of it. So, I was, I was watching him, and there was sniper fire and, and mortar fire, and he was zigzagging towards me. I mean, this, this guy was like, I'm there, and he's like, he goes there, and he's down. And all of a sudden, he sees me, and he went some more zigzag. He's down. And so he's getting closer and closer to me, and I'm getting scareder and scareder. I mean, I am, I'm never a hero. I'm never a war hero. I'm scared. And I think he, he knows I'm Jewish. He's going to execute me. <laughs> he's getting closer, and the snare, the snare, the sneer continues. Finally, he runs the last couple of feet, and he slides down next to me. And he's breathing hard. And I'm terrified, and I think the end is near, and I'm thinking, just make it quick, just make it quick. And he, he looks over at me, and in a big, big French accent, and spittle's coming out of his face, and he says, the Red Sox, they suck. <laughs> the pitching is very, very bad. I mean, this guy risked his life to tell me that. It was something I already knew. <laughs> Can you imagine that? But you don't have to travel across the world to find misery. These Mexican workers are risking their lives and their freedom to cross the Rio Grande River. They're coming to pick okra in Texas. And U.S. workers don't like this because the leaves, the okra leaves, give off an acid that eats their fingerprints away. But these are the people that are picking the food that ends up on your table and our table, and they deserve respect. In 1984, the great Globe editor, Tom Winship, said, Stan, you need to cover the famine in Ethiopia. And Colin Nickerson and I went to Sudan. We pilfered a couple of bed covers from the cartoon Hilton, and we snuck into rebel-held Ethiopia with an anti-government guerrilla group that was bringing food, medicine, and fighters to northern Ethiopia. Now, we were the first to be allowed in, and they, they made a sign, a waiver, saying it was okay if we died. I was like, yeah, well, I'll sign that. Now, I like good hotels, you know, the kind with the little gold-wrapped chocolates on the pillow. <laughs> but this was the opposite. We traveled in beat-up lorries at night. They were camouflaged by blankets during the day to avoid the Ethiopian MiGs that flew overhead. There were no roads, and sometimes we didn't use headlights. And the conditions were hor horrific. Sometimes I slept on the hood of the lorries because of poisonous snakes and tarantulas that roamed the desert. There were mines and there were bandits, and occasionally the night sky would light up with tracer bullets and bombs. Once I was so tired, I slept on the hood of the old Fiat, and we got ambushed at like 4 o'clock in the morning. I slept through most of the damn fight. But this is nothing compared to what the refugees went through. They walked hundreds of miles through the desert. They drank from polluted water and where the, the water holes were, had animals in them and waste materials, and they were sitting ducks for Ethiopian bombers that went through their villages. They had nothing, but they had a nobility about them that really amazed me. Who could be racist after meeting the starving children of Ethiopia, waiting patiently for food? 
They never pushed. They never shoved. And I remember seeing kids that didn't have the strength to shoo away the moisture-seeking flies that landed on their eyes and mouth. These kids were too weak to take any liquids in whatsoever. And their dying moans sounded like meowing cats. This Ethiopian mother and her child sat in a dark straw tent with the relentless sun going through in pinholes. You can see the love that she, here she cradled his head. And, I, and, and as a photographer, I tried to just think f-stops and shutter speeds and not think of the horror. But automatically, the, the viewfinder just filled with tears. Later on, I went to check on the child's condition, and the doctors told me that he had died that very day. And then we returned home, and there was this moronic TV feature about a gingerbread house at the mall made with 10,000 eggs. And I learned to be thankful for a glass of water, clean water. But to win two Pulitzer Prizes is a great honor. Don't get me wrong. Doors get flung open worldwide. And the images can raise money. And they can influence decision makers. But to win because of covering, covering famines and war can give you a sense of, of futility. There's another famine going on in Ethiopia right now where 10 and a half million people are at risk. Doesn't really make the news. And there's always another goddamn war to fight and another highway of death. Insane. Still, we have to keep moving forward and continue to call for basic human rights. You can't do this job unless you're a sensitive person, but if you have that sensitivity, it sears your soul. Uh, but I have faith in the young. I remember Iqbal Masai, who came to Boston to receive a Human Rights Award. Iqbal was sold into slavery at the age of four in Pakistan, but he later escaped. He came to Boston right after I returned from India, where, I, where barefoot kids were making busts of JFK in the metal factories. Iqbal and I bonded immediately. He, he was amazing. He organized a rally against child slavery. He sued his captors. He also visited the Broadmeadows School in Quincy. And there he told the kids how he was beaten and chained to, chained to a loom by carpet owners. He was half their size because of his mal malnutrition, but he told them he wanted to become the Abraham Lincoln of Pakistan. Unfortunately, Iqbal was later killed by a shotgun blast while riding his bicycle near his home on Easter Sunday. Family members believed he was assassinated. Don't buy rugs unless they have a, rug, a care mark label on them. The Quincy students vowed to raise $5,000 to build a one-room mud brick school in Pakistan. They asked schools worldwide to donate $12 each, which was the amount that Iqbal was sold into slavery for. And the results were amazing. They raised over $100,000, and dozens of schools were built. Some of the students even became human rights advocates. Now, I dedicated my book, Lost Futures, Our Forgotten Children, which raised money for UNICEF, to Iqbal. And the last time I saw him, he was high-fiving the crowd at the awards ceremony. I lost sight of him amongst the big bodies, but he turned around just before disappearing. He thrust his fist into the air, high. Keep fighting, he said. 
So keep fighting it is. Thank you. When I heard his story, I ran out and got my cap from downstairs. <laughs>